1856, Florence Nightingale returned home from the war. Now, what she did there is very interesting. Her heroics are often misunderstood and too often misrepresented. But our job here today is not to look at Nightingale's war service, but instead see what happened immediately after. You may find this hard to believe, but during this war, a careless, inefficient, egotistical, and ignorant government caused the preventable deaths of thousands of its own people. Nightingale labeled the government failings for what it was, murder. She made it her mission to prevent the same needless carnage from ever happening again. Nightingale banded with some of the most powerful and talented voices in England to wage an information campaign. It stretched across many publications, thousands of pages, hundreds of statistical tables, and yes, maps, pictorial diagrams, and many, many charts. Their intended audience was the military, political, and royal establishment elites, and in some cases, the soldiers themselves. All of these publications are collaborations. Nightingale often, but not always, is the first author of a team of experts. You might think of her as one part principal investigator and one part whistleblower. Not shown are a range of competing publications also trying to influence policy. These also had charts, and they are interesting because they show the visual foil that Nightingale's cause reacted to and strived to eclipse. To give you a sense of their effort, I've connected their information graphics across publications. You might notice a range of chart forms, many of which evolve over this five-year time span. Let's look at one. Here we have a compound bar chart that appears in the two earliest publications. It compares or relates the mortality rate of two populations, Englishmen, shown with the black bars, and English soldiers, shown with the red. The takeaway? Being a soldier is dangerous, perhaps twice as deadly compared to staying out of service. The chart is a simple example of something that Nightingale excelled at, persuading with easy to understand comparisons. Her text, tables, and charts are at their best when they present simple comparisons. The army versus civilians, the army abroad versus the army at home, this regiment versus that regiment, wounds versus disease, the English versus the French, or most famously, before versus after. But as you may already know, reading a simple chart comparison is not the same as making one. Nightingale not only imagined the needed comparison, but was also able to get the military and civilian data and do the math that made this simple, clear chart possible. When we read the hundreds of letters related to these diagrams, we can see that most of the discussion, most of the effort, is about how to access data and how to fairly do analysis. The math of statistics is not particularly hard. Most of this is just addition and subtraction. But what gets counted and what gets left out matters a lot. Determining what is appropriate and what is useful is not easy at all. Before we leave this chart, I want to point out a few things. First, it's big. Here we are photographing it last year. You are the first to see this 600 DPI image. Second, incredibly, a draft of this chart survives. When we look at its hand-drawn draft, we can see that the original color palette was blue-black with soldiers in black. It got changed. To what? To soldiers in red. A storytelling connection to the British redcoats and perhaps even also their avoidable death. Finally, we've mentioned Nightingale's name a lot, but the chart points us to someone else that belongs in the story. James Lewis worked at the General Register Office, or GRO. The GRO was the government agency responsible for the recording of vital records, such as births and deaths. Its most famous statistician was William Farr. Farr matched Nightingale's motivation and wit with his expertise in health data, analysis, and visualization. Farr balanced Nightingale's affection for the army with his own concern for the broader civilian population. The creative collaboration between William Farr and Florence Nightingale is legendary in the history of data visualization. Together, they pushed their work beyond what either was capable on their own. Farr and Nightingale looked up to Adolphe Quetelet, the Belgian champion of social physics, what we now know as social science. Their creed was a belief 
that population health could be understood through rigorous analysis, and once understood, its health could be improved. Quetelet dances throughout Farin Nightingale's correspondence as a guiding light, and on occasion, the three of them even had brunch together. But don't think that William and Florence did it by themselves. Farr brought his own GRO team, including James Lewis, to help process data and produce diagrams. Nightingale also relied on a rich network of support. It is easy to think of historic data viz as products of a lone genius toiling away. But this is rarely the case. Alexander von Humboldt, Emma Willard, W.E.B. Du Bois, they all had their workshop elves to help process data, draft stories, and print finished graphics. All of this was very expensive. If you ever why, wonder why any one effort stopped, it's often because the cash ran out. Understanding the various contributing voices across the publications can get complicated. But I want to tell you about one more collaborator, Sidney Herbert. For us, it's good enough to know that Herbert was a statesman and close confidant of Nightingale. You see, Nightingale and Farr often worked in person, so it is hard to disaggregate their process. To Herbert, however, Nightingale actually explained in writing the motivation for the diagrams. They are tools of persuasion designed for the less than statistically literate. Nightingale wrote that diagrams are to catch the sparrows. They are meant for unscientific readers who would not suffer rows and rows of statistical tables. But please make no mistake, the audience was common and vulgar when it came to science, but it was not common otherwise. Queen Victoria, who Nightingale visited and sent copies of all these publications, hovered large as the target number one. This is one of my favorite Nightingale lines. It is our flank march upon the enemy, and it leaves them not a word to say. This is what you have done with the army. They cannot answer it. They can only deny. It reminds me of what abolitionist William Wilberforce said two generations earlier to the House of Commons as he presented a model replica of the Brooks slave ship. Having heard all of this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. I hope that all that gives you a little bit more context into what Nightingale and Farr were all about. It's honestly okay if you don't completely understand it. It's a really rich and really complicated story. So here we have a diagram showing the number of living and dead at several age groups from age 20 to 40, that is the different age groups of a, of a fighting soldier. And you can see that we compare living versus dead categories, two big different color blocks on this proportional area chart. And you can see on the top, we have English soldiers compared with English men in the middle, compared with English men in a healthy district on the very bottom. Of course, the proportion of dead decreases as your eyes goes down the page. Now, maybe this isn't the best comparison across, um, across all three categories, but I do think that this chart is really interesting for one reason. And that is if we take a a closer look, you can see that the vertical axis is flipped from what we normally expect. So zero is at the top, 10,000 is all the way at the bottom. And what that does is it, is it, is it makes the, the sort of the protagonist of the story the dead. The dead are emerging from the, the bottom. Um, so I, I think that's really fascinating. I think it makes it um, a much more interesting and much more compelling chart that's that simple flip. So this diagram compares the living versus the dead, which is a pretty simple comparison. But Nightingale pointed out early on that this really isn't an honest comparison. It's not really a fair comparison. Why? Because, well, to the army, you could be alive, but if you're wounded, if you're sick, you might as well be dead to the army because you can't fight. And also, wounded soldiers and six soldiers don't stay in the army very long. They get discharged. And sometimes they die soon after they get discharged. And so she has this text that says, for the army mortality merely shows the deaths among those staying in the service long enough to die in it. It does not show the deaths 
among those discharged to die elsewhere. She also had this funny line that an army, as long as it discharges the sick fast enough, can be immortal because it will never register anybody ever dying in the army. And so with this text in mind, I want to look at another proportional area diagram. So on the left, we have a diagram representing the army at home in its present state. On the right, the label says diagram representing the army at home in an improved state. And if, if you look closely, you can see that there's this tag that says hypothetical. But really, this isn't so much a prediction as, as using sort of proxy data as a prediction. What what they're doing here is charting civil mortality and saying, hey, this is an achievable goal. If the army could be as healthy as a general population, we would, uh, we would not only have fewer deaths and fewer invaliding, we would have more active or what they label effective soldiers. And before we leave this chart, I also want to uh, zoom in for a second and first appreciate how much annotation and text and effort there is to explain what is going on. And then also, I just love the double labels on these uh, horizontal axes. And so on the top of each chart, you have each individual age uh, spelled out with, the, with each decade spelled out all the way. And then on the bottom, you actually have sort of category labels. So you have 20, 30, 40 age, and then young soldiers in their 20s and the veteran soldiers in their 30s. I, I, I just think that's really great. Before we see the next chart, let's read this Nightingale quote together. Can we say that is manslaughter to put a man to death by poison or by the knife, and not manslaughter to put him to death by the slower poison of bad ventilation and bad drainage. So far, we've avoided discussing the war directly, uh, and that, that's very intentional. But um, before we look at the next set of charts, it's important to understand that at the very beginning of the war, the sanitary condition, the, the, the sanitation in the different hospitals was, was a real nightmare. And there was an effort um, led by uh, a small group called the Sanitary Commission to change that, to clean some things up, the argument goes that that effort was really successful. And so the next set of charts is about that. And so we finally arrived at the famous Nightingale, Rose, Polar Area Diagram charts. So here we have a really simple comparison. You have a diagram on the right it's relatively large compared to the diagram on the left. You see, they're both built at the same scale. And this particular example is just showing you raw mortality, like how many people are dying. And the big idea is that there's this dashed line that connects the two diagrams. And that dashed line represents the, the, the point where the sanitary commission shows up and starts cleaning things up and things start to improve, deaths start going down. So that's the big comparison from right to left, uh, separated by the arrival of the Sanitary Commission. But there's another comparison embedded in this chart, which is really great. And that comparison is that inner circle. And you can read the explanation and it says the dotted circle represents what the mortality would have been had the army been as healthy as Manchester. Now, Manchester is an industrial city, not particularly healthy uh, relative to the rest of England. And so what this diagram is trying to emphasize is that look at how horrible uh, the death rate is compared to a particularly unhealthy city back home in England. And so these polar area diagrams are meant to be read as a set. And this first one shows total mortality. The next one shows uh, not total mortality, but causes of mortality. And we have three different categories. They overlap. If you've ever heard of Florence Nightingale and data visualization, then this, this diagram will be familiar to you. And then the third uh, compresses the comparison. So we no longer have a right versus left. It compares, compresses the timeline into one uh, single uh, one single chart. Now, I mean, do these work? Are they successful? 
In some sense, they're not successful at all. They don't prompt any imitation. I mean, nobody has ever done a chart in this format uh, successfully again. Um, they're really weird. Uh, you might call it a xenographic. But from another perspective, these charts are supremely successful. I mean, think of Florence Nightingale and company. They made all kinds of other charts and most people don't know about them. But a lot of people know about these diagrams. They're very distinctive. Um, if you want to inform somebody, you know, all informing is a product of attention. It's a product of engaging them. And the first step of getting that engagement is catching that person's attention. She was operating in an information ecosystem where she had to stand out and she had to grab people's attention. And this chart uh, does this better than, than almost any chart out there. Before we go, I wanna to return to that famous nightingale far relationship uh, by way of one of their more simple and frankly less famous charts. So here we're comparing two stack bar charts uh, once again, we have the English male population, the general pop on top, and soldiers living at home on the bottom. The big takeaway is that, hey, uh, being a soldier is really dangerous, needlessly so compared to the uh, civilian population. And there's, there's some nice things going on. We have categories of how people are dying. We also have some a nice little summary bar on the bottom. But... This is a little bit of a flawed uh, comparison because if you look in the parentheses, you can see that the top bar chart is taken from data uh, 1848 to 54, relatively recent to when this chart was made. The bottom chart is taken from data uh, that's much earlier. And so this really isn't a, a perfectly fair, perfectly honest comparison. Farr and Nightingale knew this, of course, and they worked really hard to get the right data that would help them make a better comparison. And eventually, several years later, Nightingale was able to update the data, write to Dr. Farr and say, could you kindly further the growth of your own child, meaning his diagram, by causing the enclosed diagram to be made out. And so the enclosed diagram is probably a sketch. Um, she says that something's written out in pencil. She gives new data. And uh, what's really interesting is what's at the end of this note. You can see that she, is really uh, crafting a story. She's crafting a before and after story because she's able to now say, this is how Sidney Herbert found the army. This is how he left it. You see, we are better now than the civilian population, meaning that the army is now healthier than the general population. And miraculously, we don't even ha only have this note. We actually have that draft enclosed diagram. And so here we can see Nightingale's annotations where she's editing a, a proof print. Um, she's showing where to put the labels and most importantly, how to elevate those titles so that in the final version, we have the English male population on top and then not one, but now two bars down below. The, the soldiers serving at home in the before times, this is how Lord Herbert found the army. And then at the very bottom, this is how Lord Herbert left the army. And you'll notice that that shorter stack bar chart is indeed shorter than the English male population. It really was an incredible partnership. Like I said before, a lot of their work was done in person and we have only a small window into what that was like. But uh, William Farr's daughter, Mary, wrote an observation of what it was like when Florence Nightingale would visit to work with her father. And she recorded this particular exchange where her father, William Farr, said to Florence Nightingale, well, if you do it, you will make yourself enemies. And Nightingale stood up and she looked at him and she responded, after what I've seen, I can fire my own guns. Their achievements and personalities make this an incredibly attractive story. It's a rich story, a complicated story. It's hard to tell it in only 20 minutes. It's a story that demands a bigger treatment, which is why I am so excited to be producing a new book, Florence Nightingale, Mortality and Health Diagrams. It is a beautiful book, several years in the making, full of new photography of primary sources, most never published before.
I can't wait for you to hold it and be inspired by Nightingale too. So, how can you help? How can you learn more? I will make announcements soon about how to get involved in my newsletter, which you can subscribe to at infowetrust.com. Until then, you can always contact me on Twitter. I am eager to chat this story with you today and beyond.